Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as a social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders in the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series is targeted towards both patients with asthma and healthcare professionals. And to be honest with you, I think it's going to be useful for the general public as well. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Sharmali Neinheis as our guest for today's episode. Dr. Neinheis is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine in Allergy and Immunology at the University of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. In addition to her clinical care, Dr. Neinheis has a research interest in asthma with a unique focus on lifestyle, exercise, and disparities. She is very active within the Academy and served as the lead author on the 2022 workgroup report from the Sports, Exercise, and Fitness Committee titled Recommendations for Physical Activity and Asthma, which we'll be discussing today. And with that, Dr. Neinheis, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and welcome to the show. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Now, th- I think this is a, a topic we haven't really addressed in depth on the podcast before, and I think it's going to be very useful. But I'd love to begin by learning more about you and your career focus on asthma. Uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing, when did you first become interested in this condition? And, and more importantly, what keeps you asking new questions? Yeah, so I believe really in medical school is when I had a real focus in asthma and really got introduced it. Um, through my pediatric allergy rotation, as well as I was lucky enough to have also an experience on the internal medicine side. Being in a large city, um, I really got to see um, firsthand the disparities um, that exist in asthma. And I think that's what really drew me to wanting to go into this field, as well as ask new questions about how we can reduce those disparities. And do you find that the more questions you ask, the more new questions you have afterwards? Yes, of course. I, <laughs> it's, it definitely always seems that way. Once you ask one question, another one um, arises. But I think that's what I really love about um, my my research and my job. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I appreciate you sharing. You know, one thing that I love with, with hosting the podcast is we meet so many of our colleagues that have pa- such passion for what they do. Uh, and it's great to, to have you kind of, you know, display that when we talk about these things. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to have a wide range of audience for this episode. So perhaps we can just start by having you discuss some basic information surrounding asthma. That way we're all at the same understanding and starting point. So um, along those lines, can you just start by describing the symptoms that people with asthma can experience and some of the common triggers for those symptoms? Yeah, so people with asthma can have a varied amount of symptoms and types of symptoms. So some people can experience cough, chest pain, chest tightness. Um, And then one thing that most people um, contribute with asthma is wheezing. Um, So those are some of the main um, symptoms. Um, Some of the triggers, though, can be varied. So this can uh, range from viral infections, pollutants, um, and then, of course, allergens such as molds, pollens, dust, pets, and pests. So lots of symptoms, lots of triggers. And then do you find that um, patients can have both acute symptoms and you know, they're, do, they're doing fine for weeks to months and all of a sudden out of nowhere they start to, to cough or wheeze? And then also can they suffer from more chronic symptoms on a more regular basis? Yeah, so definitely people with asthma can experience both. So I know I have some patients that have unfortunately have chronic symptoms and have symptoms, you know, multiple times per week. Um, and then on top of that, will have acute symptoms or exacerbations of their of their asthma. And then some people are doing well and um, and then they, you know, will exercise or get a cold and that will trigger their symptoms. So uh, it can be both or one or the other. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I'm always amazed at uh, the families that end up in, in my office and I walk in the exam room and they're referred to me specifically so I can, quote unquote, do the test for asthma. Uh, <laughs> is, is, is there a test that says, yes, this is asthma? And if not, how is it diagnosed? Yeah, so we do have some tests that help us with the diagnosis of asthma, but there's not, unfortunately, just one test that can um, diagnose asthma. The tests that we often use to help us diagnose asthma include a lung function test, or also known as spirometry, and that can help us to see if the airways are blocked or not, and that blockage is often caused by inflammation or swelling of the airways. Additionally, there are some other breathing tests. Uh, one's an exhaled nitric oxide test, um, which measures an amount of inflammation in the lungs. And so that can be done in a lot of doctor's offices, as well as the spirometry or lung function test. Again, sometimes those can be normal and someone can still have asthma. So we often also use symptoms as well as, as we discussed earlier, you know, what are the triggers of those symptoms? So using that um, as, and then sometimes also um, seeing if somebody responds to the therapy of asthma, that can all help us um, determine the diagnosis of asthma. It, we, you know, we know that asthma is one of the most common chronic health conditions affecting both children and adults, but can you help us understand and, and offer some numbers or percentage of the population that are affected by this condition? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, in the, especially in the pediatric population, asthma is one is the most common chronic health condition, and with that, um, up to uh, ten to twelve percent of children um, can have asthma, and in the adult population, it is lower, um, usually about eight to nine percent, but we do see certain populations being um, more impacted by um, this disease. And there's several reasons for that, probably too many to go into um, mm -hmm. today, but um, particularly uh, minoritized populations such as um, Black and African American and um, certain Hispanic um, populations um, are more affected by asthma and sometimes can be 15 to 18 percent um, of, of the population of those specific populations have asthma. Yeah, that those are huge numbers. Uh, and people listening may not, you know, com may not appreciate that, you know, that's not common. I mean, it's common for asthma, obviously, but compared to other health conditions, I mean, that just blows many, many other con conditions that we see on a regular basis out of the water in regards to the number of people that are affected by that, which I think is important why, you know, uh, we have this work group report, which we're going to discuss in a second. But before we get into that, uh, can you just briefly touch upon some of the medications or treatments that are commonly used to help control asthma? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, um, asthma is a disease of inflammation of the airways, and what we often will use then are anti-inflammatories. So these include like steroids, um, and typically we deliver those medications in an inhaled way, so it won't have an impact on your whole body. When it's used as an inhaled um, method, it really only impacts um, the airways, particularly when used in low to medium doses. Um, other things that we often use too are um, trying to avoid those triggers. So some of those things, as we mentioned earlier, can be those allergens. So if we know that you have what we call allergic asthma, and we know you have specific triggers, um, trying to avoid those triggers. No, that's great. I, I love how you talked about avoidance of triggers because now what we're going to get into with the work group report is really we're not talking about medicine necessarily to, to help you know with asthma. Um, so we're going to talk about more about physical activity and exercise. But if you could give us some background as to why the work group report was actually put together in the first place and maybe even a, a peek behind the curtains as to how something like this rises from the committee level to an actual publication, I think that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So one of the things that our committee, which is the Sports Exercise Fitness Committee, um, came together and really noticed that in a lot of the guidelines, physical activity is not discussed in detail. So that is why we wanted to produce this work group report to raise some attention to physical activity in asthma and not necessarily only how exercise can sometimes contribute to um, asthma symptoms, but really looking at it from another lens and seeing how it may actually improve asthma outcomes. So 
how this works in our um, organization is if an, a committee um, has an idea for a work group report, um, you propose that to our PDT com um, our PDT committee, and through that, that is reviewed by experts. And um, if if it uh, is approved, then you can go ahead and move forward and write the report and it's then reviewed again, has multiple levels of review. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then um, once it passes all those levels, then um, it is submitted to the um, one of our journals. So that could be one of our three journals that we have. And, um, and then it goes through the normal peer review process there. And then if approved through the journal, then it has to be approved by the board of directors. And once that is done, then that it will be published. So it sounds like there's a lot of vetting that takes place for something like this, <laughs> a long process. Yes, it does. Um, but, you know, I've been able to work with a great group of people on our committee um, that have been able to contribute and, and help out with the process. So it's been great. Oh, that's wonderful. And we'll put a, a link to the full report for anybody listening. If you go to the web page, the landing page, you'll be able to, to click on that and access it. And these are all well done. And it, it makes sense because if you go through this level of, of uh, peer review and uh, expert opinion and things like that, all of the work group reports that are put out from the academy are really top notch. Now, a major focus of this report um, in particular is how children and adults with asthma are often not counseled on the importance of exercise. Uh, can people with asthma safely participate in exercise or is it dangerous for them since it can cause symptoms, as you mentioned before? Yeah, so it is something that um, there have been several studies now showing that people living with asthma can safely participate in exercise. And this goes from people with what we would call mild disease to even severe disease. So that's something that um, it has clearly been shown that you can safely participate. Now, there are some things that we do recommend um, when participating in exercise if you have asthma. And that includes often making first of all, making sure that your asthma is controlled. So those chronic symptoms that we talked about um, before, we want to try to make sure that they're as controlled as they can be. So making sure that you're taking um, your prescribed um, regimen um, prescribed by your um, healthcare provider um, as um, as they have told you to, or a, as they have mentioned um, to you to, to take. So that's the first thing. And then the other things are definitely... Um, doing some warm-up exercises. Warm-up and cool-down has been shown to be important and to help reduce any symptoms um, of asthma with exercise. And um, depending on um, what you discuss with your healthcare provider, they may or may not recommend a pre-treatment with um, an, uh, a me medication such as uh, albuterol, which is a a medication that helps open up the airways and relaxes the muscles around the airways. So those are some things that can be done um, to help um, people living with asthma um, engage in exercise safely. Mm, that's great. And for those listening, if you if you have asthma or if you've been told before that you you shouldn't exercise, please talk to your doctor or or seek a you know a evaluation from a board certified allergist, immunologist, or or pulmonologist who can really help you with that. So I think that's great background. Uh, how should we define physical activity? Does it have to include specific forms of exercise, or is there a set frequency or duration that you know classifies as yes, this meets physical activity, or you know is it is there more of a gestalt to it? Yeah, great question. I mean, it seems so easy, but it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some definitions. And actually for physical activity itself, it's really any bodily movement generated by the muscles, your skeletal muscles that result in an energy expenditure. So that can be from, you know, picking up your cup of coffee <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, um, or, you know, from something more vigorous. Um, we usually do define um, physical activity as at different levels. So there's low physical activity, uh, moderate physical activity, and then vigorous physical activity. And when I think about moderate to vigorous, that's when you're really getting yourself out of breath um, during those activities. And you may not be able to, um, as I know, 
you know, I, I, I tell my kids, like, if you're able to hold a conversation really easily or, you know, sing a song really easily, then that's probably not more moderate or uh, vigorous um, activity. Now, um, the guidelines, both um, the World Health Organization and the U.S. Guide, uh, uh, guidelines for physical activity for Americans defines um, the amount of physical activity, and that's particularly for a cardiovascular benefit. Mm -hmm. And that for adults is um, at least 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And they also do recommend um, two to three times per week doing some sort of strength training activity as well. Now for children, they recommend 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day. So that's, that's, that's a lot more, it's a lot different um, between um, adults and um, children. But for asthma itself, it, pretend, it, it hasn't been specifically defined what exercise or what form of exercise or how, what the frequency or duration has been. Um, so I usually go by the um, World Health Organization recommendations, as I um, had previously mentioned. Okay, uh, so it sounds about twenty. It, uh, if I do the math correctly, a little more than twenty minutes a day for adults. Mm -hmm. um, if you can, if you can average that, um, which is a little bit less than what they recommend for children. And I'm also hearing you say that if I'm eating buffalo wings, the act of me raising the wing to my mouth technically is physical activity, but yet wouldn't really meet the criteria of what we define as, you know, cardiovascular or rigorous activity. Is that, is that a good understanding? Yes, of that? yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. So <laughs> are, are, uh, are some forms of physical activity easier or more beneficial for people with asthma? Yeah, so um, there are there are definitely some that have been um, found to be easier um, in general for people with asthma. So, and we have done some work um, looking at that, and really have found that actually walking is probably one of the more preferred um, physical activities in people with asthma. Um, but other things um, can include bicycle riding, um, swimming, um, particularly if it's, you know, outdoor swimming, and we can get into that um, a bit more in just a moment. Um, those are some of the activities that have been uh, found to be easier for people uh, living with asthma. Um, so as far as beneficial, Really, we're seeing that um, it can be a, a wide variety of physical of exercise can be beneficial for people with asthma. So there have been studies again looking at swimming, snow sports, um, high intensity um, interval training, um, yoga, um, and and also um, swimming. And um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, swimming could be a, a great exercise. Now, some people, if they, um, that the chlorine in the water could, could trigger their, their asthma. So that is something just to be considered. If chlorine seems to be a trigger for your asthma, then maybe swimming isn't the best. But for many people, swimming has been a great exercise for, for asthma, it's been particularly a lot of studies done in children um, living with asthma. Mm -hmm. And I, if I recall, is, is there something related to the humidity as well? So especially if you're in an indoor pool or just, or, you know, obviously if you're swimming outdoors, it's going to be warm, but um, can, can the humidity and, and the dryness of the air impact people with asthma in different ways? Yes. So that is one of um, the mechanisms that people can get exercise induced, um, what we call bronchoconstriction, which is a narrowing of the airway. And um, typically, uh, if the air is cold and dry, so as you were mentioning, so low humidity and the air is very cold, then that can really um, trigger symptoms. So that can, those um, sports or exercises that involve that, um, you know, can um, maybe a little bit more difficult for people living with asthma. But of note, there are several uh, Olympic athletes that do have asthma mm -hmm. and um, participate in winter sports. So, um, so that's something, you know, it is something that can happen, but often can be controlled as well. Mm -hmm. Now, well, we've heard you describe now, you know, um, sort of, uh, what physical activity is and, and why we want people with, with asthma to exercise and be physically active. But can you tell us some of the benefits? So what's the what's the, the real why? Why are we uh, suggesting this and, and what can people expect to uh, in regards to outcomes? 
Yeah, as I mentioned, this was kind of the impetus for this report is to really get the idea of the benefits of physical activity. And um, I think the, there, it's well known the cardiovascular benefits as well as some of the mental health benefits of exercise or physical activity um, in general. But in particular, for people living with asthma, the studies have shown improvements in asthma control as well as quality of life as well as a reduction in exacerbations and even lung function. So there was a, a recent um, systematic review with meta-analysis um, done in the adult population that really showed the, the primary um, benefits were really of asthma control and lung function. But as I mentioned, other studies have shown some improvements in quality of life, including some of the work I've done, and um, some, some others have shown improvements in exacerbations. And for those listening who aren't familiar with the different types of asthma um, studies and, and research that's done, there are there are many different ways that you can sort of measure outcomes. Sometimes it's just looking at lung function before and after or quality of life. Um, and there's, you know, arguments for and against all of these. But it sounds like in regards to physical activity, it, really, you're, you're telling me the outcomes have been great across the board of all the traditional ways that you measure benefits from this, uh, including exacerbation. So that just, just sounds profound to me, which is amazing. Um, you also discussed earlier some of the common asthma symptoms that people can experience, uh, such as chest tightness, wheezing, coughing, difficulty breathing. But are there non-asthma related reasons why people with or without asthma may experience these same symptoms during exercise? And how are we supposed to figure out the difference? Yeah, so definitely probably the um, one of the most common reasons where somebody might have some shortness of breath um, or cough um, potentially um, during exercise um, could be due to what we call this kind of non-deconditioning. Uh, so if you're not used to exercise, it does take some time for your body to adapt to um, doing the exercise and, um, and building that endurance. So sometimes it could be that. And one way to potentially know is stop doing the exercise. And if you start improving pretty quickly, um, then, 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 then probably it may just be due to um, some deconditioning. Um, now, if that is the case, um, that I would recommend, you know, getting back to doing the exercise, but maybe you need to go at a slower pace to, to build things up. So maybe, you know, walk half a block, then move it up to a block two blocks, et cetera. So, um, so that is something to do to help build your endurance. Now, um, particularly in the adult population and older adult population where somebody might have some other um, conditions or what we would call comorbidities, um, some things like heart failure, um, that could be um, something that, that may make it difficult to breathe um, during exercise um, or with exertion. Um, other conditions too, like um, called COPD or emphysema, that can also um, make it more difficult um, to breathe during exercise as well. So those are, I think that, that gives you a, a very broad overview of um, maybe some of the um, potential other reasons besides asthma that you might have some asthma-like symptoms during exercise. Mm -hmm. and what, can you touch upon um, the vocal cords and how those can actually produce similar symptoms and, and um, how we can separate that from asthma? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up as well. Um, so um, there is a condition where sometimes um, the vocal cords really should remain open when you take a deep breath in, but for some reason, sometimes they close. And with that, you feel like you can't get any air in. And um, with that, you know, sometimes that can be triggered by um, uh, allergic rhinitis, or um, if you're having allergies and having nasal symptoms that can irritate the vocal cords. Um, so that's, that's, that's potentially one reason, especially if you're exercising outside a lot. So that is something um, to, um, to consider, uh, another thing to consider um, if, you know, with exercise, if you're having any of these asthma-like symptoms. Now for diagnosis, um, that typically you do need to see a specialist for. Um, so you can see an asthma specialist um, or an ear, nose, and 
throat specialist where um, they can take a look at your vocal cords and um, see if um, potentially um, you're having this abnormal um, closure of the vocal cords during, um, during specific maneuvers. Yeah, I appreciate you describing some of those things because it can be tricky. It, it can be tricky for us as well, right? When we see these mm -hmm. patients that you know describe these symptoms during exercise, and and there can be a process involved to try to tease it out. But I think the bottom line is, anybody listening, if you are having difficulty with exercise or symptoms that you know concern you, please talk to your to your personal doctor or, or specialist and uh, let them know about it because they can help you know figure out a way to get you to exercise uh, and and thrive. Um, that's the goal for everybody. The, the work group report separated age groups into children and adolescents and then adults. Uh, starting with children and, and ad, adolescents, what are some of the unique factors that are related to barriers towards physical activity in this age group? Yeah, this is one of the things we really wanted to highlight because um, when we were looking at um, the different age groups, we really did see some, some unique factors. So in children and adolescents, um, one of the big ones is embarrassment because of their disease. They didn't really want to feel different from their peers. They wanted to be able to jump into um, uh, sports or other exercises without having to use their inhaler prior. Um, also, um, it, it's been shown that there is some bullying associated with it. So maybe that um, contributes to this embarrassment. Um, and then also, unfortunately, there's um, a lack of school-based resources that can really help children feel comfortable in engaging um, in uh, physical activity. So those were probably the main things that we saw in, in children and adolescents. You, you remind me of a conversation I had with um, a pulmonologist who works with um, the the college football team where I am in Columbus, Ohio. You may have heard of the Ohio State University. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm obligated to say that. Um, but uh, the conversation was along the lines of there are there are many um, athletes on the team, so football players at the highest level of college football, you know, the best of the best, and with asthma, and they were afraid to use their inhaler in front of their teammates because they they saw it as a sign of weakness, uh, and you had to have the conversation of no. Like this, this will actually improve your performance. Um, so, you know, for anybody listening out there and athletes at all levels, uh, especially in high school, um, you know, this is this is important for you to address and, and you know, definitely um, do something about it because it will actually make you a better athlete in many ways. So what about adults? How do their barriers differ from the younger age group and what should we be aware of? Yeah, so we mentioned it a little bit earlier, but um, comorbidities um, or other medical problems can, um, that we often see in adults and older adults, um, that, that can be a barrier. So if somebody has asthma, but they also have um, heart failure or they also have um, arthritis, that could definitely limit um, their ability to engage in um, the proper amounts of physical activity. So, you know, the, having multiple um, conditions to manage that are impacted by physical activity, that is a big barrier. The other one um, is time management. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, as adults, we have a lot of uh, competing um, interests, but also just um, responsibilities. So, um, you know, we have caregiver responsibilities. Sometimes we're um, of children or parents um, and, um, you know, work and other things. So really trying to fit that in. So that's not really unique to asthma per se, because I think mm -hmm. even if you don't have asthma, that's um, an issue. Um, and then definitely the other last thing, and this is maybe particularly in the older adult population, is polypharmacy. So if somebody's taking a lot of medications, some of those medications have side effects like dizziness. Um, and if, if somebody's feeling dizzy, it, it may, you know, that that may impede their their ability to to engage in uh, physical activity or exercise. So after this great conversation thus far, I'm going to put you on the spot. Should healthcare professionals proactively discuss the importance of exercise with all patients who have asthma? And if so, is this routinely done? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we discussed the benefits um, and I think, you know, the the results that we're seeing from the many, many studies now that have been done is that we should be discussing um, 
we should be discussing exercise with our patients, um, in particularly with asthma, but probably with all our patients, but as, you know, asthma specialists, definitely, um, you know, with asthma. And um, at this most recent uh, Quad AI meeting, I had the opportunity um, to present with some of my colleagues um, on this topic. And one of the things that I learned really um, as I was um, preparing for the talk is that, um, you need to counsel 12 people in order to get one person to change their behavior regarding mm -hmm. physical activity. So that is so much lower than the number um, of people needed to um, counsel for smoking cessation. That is, you need to counsel 60 people in order to get one person to change. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty low if we can, again, try to counsel people um, I think we can definitely see some some benefits in, in asthma. As far as is this routinely done, um, it, it it varies. I don't think we have good data. Um, our actually our committee, our sports exercise fitness committee, did a survey um, among asthma specialists. Um, uh, a, a few years ago, and uh, we we found in the sample of, of survey respondents that actually about 69% of them said that they um, did talk to their patients with exercise. I do think that might be a biased sample because our sample, you know, first of all, was very interested in the topic because they responded to the survey, <laughs> and actually a lot of them also engaged in physical activity regularly themselves. But um, I would say that's unfortunately the the limited data that we have. So, um, but I, I pr personally think that number is lower. But um, but that's something you know I think we could try to work to improve. Yeah. Well, you had just mentioned how um, for adults in particular, one of the barriers is just time. Uh, we, you know, all of us are just stretched so thin with with everything we have going on. Well, I think the same goes for healthcare providers, right? When we have patients in the office and trying to navigate the day in each individual encounter. So the work group offers some very practical advice to help clinicians incorporate these important discussions into each patient encounter. What are the five A's? And can you offer examples of how to use this when discussing exercise? Yeah. So, um, so these are definitely models that have been used again, not necessarily in asthma, but just in general to try to increase, um, physical activity or any really behavior change. So this could be again, applied to smoking cessation. But first of all, the first A is to ask. So you need to know, first of all, um, you know, have they participated in regular physical activity and what are some of the things that they enjoy? And then you would want to, the second A is to advise. So you want to be able to provide some personalized information on the benefits of change. So if somebody um, is having a hard time um, um, walking their, their children to school because of their asthma, maybe indicate that, you know, if, we, if you slowly start getting into regular physical activity, then, you know, they might be able to spend more time with their family. Um, and um, then, um, also maybe even talk about what are the benefits it'll have on asthma as well as some of the other cardiovascular and mental health benefits. Then you might wanna assess, um, that's the third A. So really want to address, you know, what have you done in the past? Um, what are some of those barriers that, that we talked about earlier? And are they ready to change? So if, if they're actually committed and ready, um, kind of mentally to, to make that change and include physical activity in their, um, in their everyday life. And then the next thing, the fourth A is to assist. So help them strategize overcoming barriers. So maybe if they say, I don't have time, then really helping them try to figure out, okay, well, um, you know, are there ways um, that you can just become more, um, more mobile? So, uh, and increase um, the physical activity, like maybe, when you go grocery shopping, parking farther away, don't look for that that yeah. spot that's like right up front. Um, so just little things like that, all of those things kind of can build. And then the last thing is is the last A is arrange. So arrange follow up and keep asking them about um, you know if they did um, increase their physical activity or if they're still not ready. Checking to see um, if their readiness for change um, is is happening, and then definitely during the those follow ups, also praising attempts at change. So I think those are mainly the five A's, and those are some ways to to use it uh, when discussing exercise. 
I like that so much. Um, I think that it it's, makes it personal. It makes it more meaningful. And on, from our perspective, it forces us to ha you know, have a conversation with that person in front of us, which is very different than just you know, handing them a sheet that says you need to exercise more. And, and here are some examples to you. So I, I, I appreciate you taking the time to go through that. You, you mentioned readiness for change a couple of times. So what is the trans-theoretical model of change? Why is it important for clinicians to be aware of it? And most importantly, how can it be used to help patients with asthma become more physically active? Yeah, so it's it's a, a long word, uh, the <laughs> trans theoretical model, we often just call it the TTM, but it's a psychological framework that really helps to explain intentional health behavior adoption and maintenance. So one thing that I really like about it, and similar to the five A's that it really takes into consideration what an individual's motivational readiness for changes. So are they, um, there's, there's five different stages. So are they what we call in the pre-contemplation um, stage? And that is just, you know, often they're not really thinking about it. So your goal um, would be to start getting them to think about it. Again, just kind of creating that awareness. Um, if they are in what we call the contemplation um, phase or stage, um, so maybe they know that they realize, yeah, I'm not engaging in 150 minutes per week or enough exercise. Um, so getting them to start thinking about, okay, well, I'm glad you're start, you realize that there's a problem and um, start contemplating and they're maybe start having that contemplation of like, okay, I need to start doing something more. Um, so definitely encouraging them to being more physically active. Um, the third stage is preparation. So starting to really start thinking, okay, well, maybe I could start, you know, walking 10 minutes during my lunch break. Um, so, you know, try, trying to think um, some of those things. So really encouraging them to be regularly physically active. And then the fourth stage is action. So now they're starting to do the behavior and um, you as a provider may want to help provide, um, you know, advice on how to maintain that, 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 that habit. Um, and then the last stage is maintenance. So mm -hmm. you want to, you know, main, you know, starting it is great. You know, every, especially January one, the gyms are packed, mm -hmm. um, you know, every, but then by, you know, um, you know, September, October, they're, they're empty again. I, so really, you know, <laughs> how to get I, back on track of that. So. <laughs> I would say they're pretty empty by January 15th, but uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, another great example of, of really making it personal, um, motivating each individual based upon, you know, what, what's important to them and factors into their life. What do you do in your practice? Do you have standardized questionnaires that you hand out or have you just practiced this for so long that you readily incorporate this discussion into patient care? I think it's definitely always a work in progress, even mm. though, you know, I'm very interested in this area and I do research in this area. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that 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 still, you know, we, it, you know, takes time, takes time for me to make sure I'm thinking about it. But one of the things and we talk about this in the work group report a little bit is um, using, you know, um, using exercise as a vital sign. So there is a big push is that, you know, we collect a lot of vital signs. Um, so maybe having the people that are collecting the vital signs ask one simple question of, are you engaging in, you know, the 150 minutes of, extra, of moderate to vigorous um, physical activity per week? Just that one question, yes or no. And then that could definitely alert the provider to say, hey, this is the first A, the, you know, asking, you know, what are you doing? Um, just um, so that that kind of gets maybe the first A out of there. Um, and then, you know, after I, you know, ask, you know, have that information, then that definitely um, provides us the the platform to begin kind of talking about like, oh, if you're not, then, you know, what are some of those barriers and talking about the benefits of asthma as well. Now, one of the things that our committee um, just um, um, got approved to put on the website is an exercise prescription 
this has been shown to be helpful primarily in the primary care um, arena um, of helping um, start the conversation and um, you know actually give a prescription to the patient um, to to engage in exercise. Now our handout that we have on the website on the um, Quad AI website. Um, really just talks about, okay, you know, these are the benefits. So it kind of goes over the, the benefits of asthma, what kinds of exercise you should be doing, um, and how many times per week, it gives some examples. And then also kind of goes over like, what you need to do to be able to engage in physical activity regularly. Like, again, as we talked about taking your controller medication, um, making sure you pre-treat, um, do warm-up exercises. So that's a tool that could also be used that, that I tend to use in my practice um, to, to help me discuss it, but also um, give something to the patient so they can say, okay, this is my, um, we call it the movement prescription. So mm. um so that's something that is available. No, I like that. I mean, our patients are so used to us giving them medications through prescription. So it, as you've discussed throughout this conversation, this is such an important part of their their care that, uh, you know, we're actually writing it down and, and having, a, you know, the prescription to hand to them. I, I like that a lot. Well, what about clinicians? So they say, okay, this is great. Uh, Dr. Neinheis, I'm, I'm motivated. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this in my practice on a regular basis. And they start practicing these things and having these conversations with patients, but then they encounter resistance, uh, either because you know patients have struggled with exercise in the past or they don't see the benefit. What, uh, what advice do you have for those uh, difficult conversations? Yeah. So I think, again, going back to some of those models that we discussed is, you know, if they're in the contemplation mode or, um, or, um, or yeah, if they're in the, in the contemplation mode, um, really, again, assessing those barriers and, you know, sometimes you're not, it's not going to be, oh, I'm going to just give, you know, a, uh, some physical activity advice. And then the next, next time I see them, they're going to be ready, you know, training for a 5k or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, it is going to be something that takes time and, um, um, and, you know, similar to, to smoking, some people have to try to quit several times, um, before it actually, they are, and, and, we're able to see that behavior change. So it is something that just, you know, I would say, you know, keep at it and um, don't be discouraged. I also wanted to add um, is that, again, this physical activity counseling doesn't have to be something that's 10 or 15 minutes, as you said mm -hmm. earlier, you know, this is something that, you know, we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, to address all of um, the issues that we want to. Um, but you know, even just touching upon it for one or two minutes has been shown to to be beneficial. So, um, you know, two patients. So just even spending one or two minutes on this with your patients that can um, that that can um, help. And again, if you're doing it at each visit, that that will that time builds up. So. Mm -hmm. No, and I found personally that if you're consistent with it over time, and you know, we have the benefit, we get to know our patients for years and years, um, which is unfortunate for them, but I think it, it really strengthens that relationship we have with them. They learn to anticipate it. And, and I've had many instances where they say, I know what you're going to ask, and here's what I've been doing. Um, so I think being consistent with it can uh, pay dividends as well. Uh, what about, you know, all these different forms of wearable technology? Uh, there's mobile health apps, there's digital health tools at our disposal for asthma. Can these, or for exercise as well, I guess, can these be helpful um, for patients uh, to get them to exercise more consistently? And if so, how? Yeah, so definitely these um, uh, wearable technology and mobile apps can be very helpful. Um, really, especially the ones that, um, you know, are wrist worn or even waist worn, um, those could really help with self monitoring. So you could get an idea of how many steps you're taking. And they'll even tell you um, the amount of kind of more of this moderate or vigorous physical activity. So those are some of the things that, um, you know, the, that those, um, the wearables can do. As far as some of the mobile apps, um, those could also help provide, you um, you know, some of some of the mobile apps can provide um, some regimens as far as okay, some people don't know what to start off with, what exercises to do, and so you could definitely use an app to help you, help guide you, and and prepare you, and 
say, okay, well, Monday, I'm going to do this Wednesday, I'll do this. And they'll, you know, through your phone, you can watch, you know, doing those exercises, you know, in your home itself. So those are some of the ways um, that, that you can um, use those. I, I do also like um, the wearables, because some of them can even measure um, heart rate, as well as oxygen levels, though the oxygen levels, I would say, you know, aren't necessarily as accurate as, as um, they're, they're really estimates. So um, I would be a little bit cautious, but definitely the heart rate um, can be um, beneficial. So you can kind of get a sense too of, you know, your, what is your target heart rate and um, for getting those moderate to vigorous um, activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you describe that, it makes me think of, you know, we, we've all been, it's ingrained in us that we need to have eight glasses of water a day, right? And now it's 10,000 steps. But when you actually take a dive and look at the evidence to support the origin surrounding that, um, it's really fascinating because it, it doesn't make any sense that like there is no good evidence that says everybody's going to benefit from the same level. But my goodness, it works, right? Because it, it just, it's simple. It gives you something to kind of a target to look for, look, look towards. And then with these wearables now, you can look at that and say, okay, I got to get my steps in and things along those lines. So, well, you know, as we wrap up our conversation, uh, would it be okay if I, if I asked you some more personal questions? I always like to try to get to know our guests a little bit better. Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, first, do you mind sharing your favorite forms of exercise or physical activity? Yeah. So I... I, I don't want to get bored, so I always am switching things up, and mm -hmm. I do um, multiple things. Um, I enjoy going for walks. Um, I have a, a dog, so I like taking my dog for a walk, um, but I also enjoy you know, bicycle riding. Um, I also um, enjoy playing tennis. Um, so those are definitely some of um, the exercises that I like, but I am very open to trying um, new things. So, you know, whether it's like, I'm actually going to start taking golf lessons because I've never really played golf. Uh -huh. And so it's just, I, I really enjoy being active um, myself and trying new things. So you must not like yourself very much if you want to learn how to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm self taught myself i need lessons but yeah it's uh, it's fun it's uh once you get the hang of it <laughs> yeah yeah uh you know for, for me personally i learned many years ago that i just naturally i wake up pretty early in the morning i i typically am uh i'm awake by 5 30 or, or 6 and that's when i like to get my workout in before the rest of the house wakes up and i kind of get it done and i don't have to worry about it do you have a specific routine um and if so what struggles have you had with maintaining it it sounds like you try to you try to mix things up a little bit but tell us a little bit more about how you try to be consistent yeah i mean i'm kind of similar to you i have um found that you know once i um you know, started having a family, um, the, the kids keep, keep me running um, most of the day. So if I want to set aside, you know, a specific time, I have to do it before the rest of the house is awake, as you said. Um, so I typically do try to get my, um, you know, routine in when I have, you know, some, some time for myself. And I, I think it also just makes me appreciate, okay, you know, this is, this is the time I'm taking for myself to make myself healthier and stronger, both mentally and physically. So um, there's definitely sometimes, you know, some, some lapses um, that, um, that I think we all have, um, you know, if you get sick, um, you know, and you can't exercise during that time, then that is something that, you know, trying to get back into it. I even notice if I don't exercise for four or five days, I kind of start to get feel that deconditioning when I when I get back into it. Um, so, um, but I think just kind of persistence, and I think, um, and just saying, okay, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take time and do something, you know, for myself. Um, you know, I think that's kind of what what really um, helps motivate me, motivate me even when I do have those, those lapses. And I just, I, and every single time I do it, I just feel better. So, and mm -hmm. so I just know it's like, okay, you're going to feel so good when, when you're done. Um, and I know it's going to help me sleep better. It's going to help me stay more alert during the day. So just really thinking about those benefits. So I would say for our asthma patients, this could help you, you know, um, keep your asthma under better control, um, may help reduce those flares of asthma. So really thinking of the benefits, um, even when you don't want to do it, um, even just starting small, you know, going for a walk and, and, and doing that. So. 
Did you hear that, listeners? Even the experts, such as Dr. Nienheis, struggle with this as well. So <laughs> I, appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you sharing with that, sharing that with us. Um, yeah. All right. So the last two questions are very similar, but they're they're slightly different. Uh, if you could push one text message, all right. So you have the, the ability to reach every person with asthma with one text message. What would it be, and why? Yeah. So um, from one of the studies I did, one of um, the people always kind of use this. Um, like mantra, and I, I really love it, is just keep on keeping on. Um, so really just, you know, just keep keep getting motivated and keep keep doing the things, but also trying to keep doing a little bit more. So um, so I think that is one thing that I just has have always found inspirational, whether or not you have asthma. So, um, but I think I, I would hope, you know, to my patients, um, something like that would would just help be inspiring. Yeah, I like that. Okay. In a similar vein, if you could push one text message to every clinician who cares for people with asthma, what would that be and why? I would use, I, I would think I would say like exercise is medicine. So just really, mm -hmm. you know, that, that really thinking about exercise is medicine. Again, we really are familiar with those cardiovascular benefits, um, but also there's a lot of mental health benefits that, you know, have been shown that are actually immediate. As I mentioned earlier, you know, for me personally, it can help re reduce anxiety. Um, and, um, but also, of course, thinking it um, for it um, for asthma. Um, so, as as we discussed um, throughout this hour. All right. So, everybody listening, if you get a random text message from a number you're not familiar with, and it says it says either keep on keeping on or exercises medicine, now you know where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dr. Nienheis, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I think this was a great conversation. We'll link again to the work group report so everybody can read it on their own time. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think um, I, I just hope you, again, people are really thinking that you know, we can use exercise as medicine. Well, thank you again. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Please visit www.aaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.